School Matters. I'm Sean Gilliland. On this week's show, we'll hit the ground running for a great cause at Carver Elementary, catch up with this year's All Henrico Reads author, and check out some hands-on 3D learning taking place at Baker Elementary. All that and much more on this week's show. First up, we head to Deep Bottom Park, where Highland Springs High School students enjoyed Kids to Parks Day. Wetlands are kind of right where land and water start to overlap, sometimes it's dry, sometimes it's wet. It results in this incredibly awesome ecosystem that we're in right now. Highland Springs High School for the past couple years has done a program with the James River Association where we go canoeing and we learn about the watersheds, we learn about tides, we learn about the abiotic and biotic factors, and we also get an opportunity to do some water quality testing. Hold that into the sample cup. There you go, pull it up. Let that bubble travel up and down and mix it. Flip it. Let that bubble mix it. Flip it again. What do you see? What do you observe? It's blue. blue. The question is, can you have too much dissolved oxygen? Um, for our purposes, no. But if you go up north, sometimes if you have a lake that's frozen but there's no snow on top, that ice um, allows light to shine through so stuff can photosynthesize and produce oxygen. And then you end up with fish kills caused by too much oxygen rather than 99% of the time too little oxygen. So it's a great opportunity for our guys. I'd say at least over half of our guys have never been canoeing, never even been on a boat. And for them to have this opportunity is just an awesome experience. This year we're actually very fortunate. We got a grant with the uh, Kids to Park grant from the National Park Trust. And they actually paid for us completely to come out and uh, go canoeing with them. Kids to Parks Day was launched in 2011 with the goal of connecting kids and families with their local state and national parks. What an exciting way for our students to spend the day. Next up, we're off to Fairfield Middle, where the Falcons welcome professionals to share their trades during college and career week. Well, today is Fairfield Middle School's annual career fair. We have professionals from all over. We have veterinarians, policemen, firemen. We want to see some of the hose we use. You can see the fire truck, the fire engine behind me with some of our students. This is just one of the tools that we have that can help us do that. So we also have optometrists, we have pediatrician, nurses, and we have a musician. It's the students at Holland Springs High School's ACE Center, they come out every year and they represent cosmetology, um, criminal justice, hospitality, masonry, carpentry, nurses aid, pharmacy technician, and radio, and computer systems. And this is extra special for me personally because the students that are at the ACE Center were my last group of eighth graders. So now they are juniors and to see them in their element speaking to my current eighth graders. It's just a wonderful experience. I love this time of year. I love uh, facilitating this program, but that is the best part. When it's hands-on opportunities like this, when they can really feel it and see it, um, that's the best thing. And that way they'll really have a better understanding of that profession. The Falcons wrapped up career week with graduation day and teachers and staff members wore their caps and gowns in an effort to show the middle schoolers what's to come for them in the future. Fairfield Falcons truly are rising to the challenge. The Falcons will be flying high after checking out all of those great career options. Representatives from the Better Future Fund and Papa John's Pizza 
were on hand to congratulate a Gaten Elementary student for her first place winning essay on impacting improvements to their communities. HCPS TV was there to capture the moment. We want to bring out our fifth graders into um, asking them how they can better their community. So we had one student who submitted an essay on how they would better their community by attending college. So this student wrote a phenomenal essay on how they want to contribute to the community by making everybody just a little bit healthier, setting up programs throughout the community to help with that. Um, we also have found out a little bit more information that not only um, in regards to this essay are they helping the community, but in other ways. They are trying to be out in the community and help collect food, things like that. So this is the kind of essay that just brought tingles to us all when reading it. Um, so I will let Melanie take over and let this student know what they want. All right, guys, so I'm going to kind of go over what our winner, oh man, her name is right there, I gave it away. I chose to take a step forward and come up with a solution to a problem in our community. The issue I see is the large amount of obese or overweight people in our community. I have researched and found that almost a third of Metro Richmond is considered obese. Obesity is a big health concern because it can cause high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease. These bad habits can also be passed down to the next generation. Congratulations to Mary Kate. She won a $1,000 college savings plan from Virginia 529, a family pack of tickets to the recent NASCAR race at Richmond Raceway, and of course pizza to share with her classmates. Don't go away because after the break, we'll meet all Henrico Reads author Raina Grande. Here's another two minute history report. When you think about wars fought here in America, there's the Civil War, and of course the American Revolution. But what do you know about the one in the middle, the War of 1812? In the early years of building our nation, European countries viewed the U.S. as weak. The army was small and the navy had little respect. Great Britain was regularly declaring impressment, forcing sailors from random ships into joining their Royal Navy. In 1807, the USS Chesapeake was attacked by Britain's HMS Leopard near the coast of Virginia. Facing little resistance, the Leopard took four prisoners, but the incident triggered a series of embargoes between the two countries. Tensions grew when the U.S. expanded west and Britain supported the Indians. Finally, with influence from Henry Clay and John Calhoun, two warhawks from the house, James Madison declared war on Great Britain. This means war. It began with the U.S. attacking Canada, part of the British Empire, and the Brits capturing portions of Michigan. Battles on American soil and waters continued for the next two years. Then in August of 1814, British General Robert Ross attacked America's capital and Washington burns. Luckily, Dolly Madison, the very brave first lady, saved George Washington's portrait from the flames. Then the British launch a 25-hour attack on Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Witnessing the event, Francis Scott Key is inspired to write a poem that later becomes the famous Star Spangled Banner. Finally, the Treaty of Ghent is signed. The war ends, and neither side loses land to the other. Word traveled pretty slow in those days, and the U.S. wins the Battle of New Orleans even after peace is declared. This makes General Andrew Jackson a major pop star of the day. So here it is in a nutshell. There was a big bully off the Virginia shore, so Warhawks declared that it was time for war. There's two years of fighting with the White House in ruin. Dolly saved George, and we got a new tune. No major changes, boundaries stayed the same, but one soldier won by gaining national fame. That's the War of 1812 in two minutes. So if I ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? 
Perhaps you don't know yet where you want to be, or perhaps you already know. Maybe you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or a professional athlete, or maybe you want to be an actor or a director or a teacher or hopefully a writer. I hope there's some writers here in the room. But whatever you decide to be, I encourage you to use your passion and your talent to create positive changes in the world. Every single one of you has the power to create that change. And I really do believe that if we all take the time to give of ourselves, give of our passions, give of our talents, we will be able to create those bridges between us and finally start tearing down the walls that separate us. Thank you so much. That was Raina Grande speaking at Glen Allen High School for the 2018 All Henrico Reads event. The Jaguars were truly inspired by her book, The Distance Between Us, and set out to show how much it meant to them. So we have All Henrico Reads where we choose a book and the author comes and talks about that book. So one of the questions I would often ask myself is, you know, what can I do? I'm just one person, I'm just a writer. To have her come and know that she wants to get her point across about what she did experience and for her to be that dedicated about something that she wrote really showed the passion she had behind the book. Well, we read the book, The Distance Between Us by Raina Grande, and it deals a lot with how people are treated because they look different and the struggles that they have when that happens. That was something I wanted to highlight here at Glen Allen as we are a diverse population, and I wanted to show as many differences that we have, but that we kind of all are, are one and need to be united in taking care of one another. We all work together to make a display outside, which is basically the quotes that I guess were the deepest or that meant a lot. And they're all anonymous because a lot of them are really, really personal. I wanted it just to be true, honest words. And so nobody knows whose words belong to whom. Some of the pictures that are in there, there are no words. Well, I think really we weren't trying to do anything else except just kind of be simple and sleek. You know, we wanted the map in the background for sure, just to really symbolize and kind of drive home the point that we come from all over the world. But as for the actual cubes, they just kind of lent themselves well to like a nice aesthetic and something simple and easy to look at. So we wanted to do an activity that related to the book. So we had a canned food drive. I know that in the book, she was in poverty a lot. I think we're just trying to kind of prevent that same situation from happening again with collecting all these cans, um, just help those people that are in need. Anybody in Glen Allen that needs food or needs help goes to Graham's Basket. They're actually like down the street from us, so it was nice to help a local charity. So we thought that was just a neat way to incorporate some of the book into an activity for the school. In short, I can tell you we worked really hard on it. A lot of effort went into it on my own part, on Miss Harden, Glen Allen's high school librarian part, many other teachers, students. So it took a long time. The, the vision that I had for it was in October, and for the unveiling, it was the last week of March, and it was exactly what I envisioned, which is very rarely what happens in art. I just, I really think it's amazing to see and it's amazing to see people's reactions and what people are learning from this. I think it gives people a voice and it tells them that their story matters, which is another reason why this book was chosen, was because the author wanted to tell her story, which is so many other people's stories. The words are very important, the pictures are very important, and helping others is very important, listening to their stories. I want them to feel like that they belong here, and we want them to feel like that they're family. What a moving display created by the students and librarians at Glen Allen High School. The Academy at Virginia Randolph students were busy working on their skills in horticulture, and the community was able to reap the rewards at the school's recent plant sale.
Now for another 90 second history report. Politicians fight, that's nothing new. You hear about it every day, but did you know that a cabinet member and a vice president once pulled guns on each other? Back in 1791, Aaron Burr took the New York Senate seat from incumbent Philip Schuler, father-in-law of Alexander Hamilton. You know, the guy on the $10 bill. That made me mad. A few years later in 1800, the Electoral College can't decide between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr for president. Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury, breaks a deadlock, calling Jefferson the lesser of two evils. Oh, I'm mad. Public name calling continues for years, until finally, Vice President Aaron Burr challenges Alexander Hamilton to a duel. In July of 1804, the two met outside Weehawken, New Jersey. The story has it that Hamilton fired first with a shot near Burr's head. Burr responded with a shot in Hamilton's abdomen, which eventually kills him. Burr is later charged with murder. He serves no time, but his political career is ruined. Oh, no! So here it is in a nutshell. Two colonial heroes rose to fame. When things went bad, each used the other to blame. One lost his life, the other his name. Politics truly is a dangerous game. That's the Burr and Hamilton duel in 90 seconds. This summer, conservation police officers and Virginia State Troopers are teaming up to save lives. Because we know the drunk boaters on the water become drunk drivers on the highway. Drunk boating is drunk driving. Alcohol use is a leading factor in fatal boating accidents and it's directly to blame for one third of our fatal accidents on our highways. Don't drink and drive. And don't drink and boat. Do your part to keep it a safe zone. This is the moment I knew. His future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Welcome back to the show. Hands-on learning was the name of the game at Baker Elementary. Students from Roth Middle visited their neighboring school to help third graders learn math manipulatives with the help of some creative 3D printing. Who likes space when they're talking about like Earth? You like out of space? Cool things like that. So that's a sphere too, but it's a really big one, right? If we're all living on it, that would be an extra big one. Well, we started it by trying to find a more interesting way for students to look at three-dimensional shapes. In eighth grade, we studied volume and surface area. We were trying to find a way to make that a more um, authentic learning experience for them. So we started by having them create these 3D shapes um, on a website where they were able to get them printed onto a 3D printer. Trying to find teaching the kids, you know, stuff I know and things they're about to learn and stuff. Okay, so the first simplest shape is a cube, and it got six faces. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We came here to teach the third graders how to do 3D shapes. We're usually the people sitting in the crowd, but now we're like up there like a teacher. So, but after we got used to it, it was fun. We were just in third grade, and so we know how it feels, you know, like what kids want to know, what, how they want to learn it and stuff. The thought was if Baker, who lost a lot of their shapes last year in the fire, a lot of their manipulatives, we could create these and bring them to Baker. The 3D printing, that was like a fun experience to watch, watch like the, how the, the stuff came into like plastic hard shapes. And it was fun making it, it was fun making it. They were amazing. When I get to middle school, I would actually want to do that and um, like come to a different school and like do a presentation. I learned about what the shapes look like and how they work, how many sides they have, bases, flat parts, stuff like that. 
It was really great because it was very interactive, it was very hands-on, and they also got to see a connection between what they'll learn and then eventually also what they'll learn when they get to middle school so they'll see that their learning continues and they build upon it as they move through school. It gives them a chance like to see how we know them too and that it follows them all the way like till they get to college. My shit too flat me 3D. I don't need it. Pull a drop top with a cylinder. <laughs> Two sides. New shape when I mess with my AP. New prism. I'm gonna think my shapes. Hop up the bus to school and I land my shape too flat me 3D. I don't need it. Pull a drop top with a cylinder. Two sides. New shape when I mess with my AP. Carver Elementary students got in step for a great cause at the school's run-a-thon. The Cougars were running laps as part of their 50th anniversary celebration and also in an effort to raise money for the STEAM program at the school. Let's take a look. Today we are doing a run-a-thon, trying to raise money for STEAM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics resources here at school, and this is our first ever run-a-thon. age group and they are coming out and running about 10 minutes so seeing how many laps they can get. So we got the Chick-fil-A cow, we got some parents out here, we got all our teachers out cheering everybody on so it's been it's been a great event so far for our first year. I am so happy it's been awesome to be able to run with them as well and um, I'm so proud of them they've done an awesome job so far. Close to 500 students participated in the event and helped raise $3,350. Great job, Cougars! We're going to close the show at Pocahontas Middle School, where students in Kerry Evans' art classes combine their love of technology with art to create some unique pictures. For School Matters, I'm Sean Gilliland. Thanks for watching. Today is we are going to absorb some inspiration for a non-objective piece by looking for some of the elements and principles in nature. Kids love technology. They love their phones, they love their social media, they love their laptops. So this project sort of integrated something that they already love to do. They love to take pictures and they love to edit and they love to use their filters. And the goal of the project was for them to capture the mundane schoolyard and then transform it into aesthetically pleasing photos. Look around and see what you can find outside that kind of will help inspire a non-objective piece. My picture was of a leaf that it, it had rained and then the night before it froze and it had frost all over it. She, she wanted us to take pictures of something, a different perspective so of so plants that looked really big or zoomed in to this flowers. Line, you usually don't look at a leaf and think of it as a big image. And so I took a picture of that and I thought it was really cool. We went outside, we took all these pictures and then we came back in and used several different editing softwares and they edited their photos to increase the aesthetic quality. So we talked about the elements and principles of photography, we talked about composition, a lot of things again that photographers sort of focus on when they are taking pictures. She told us to kind of like look a different way that you would normally take a picture of. So I kind of took a picture of inside the pine cone instead of just the outside. It was a different perspective of something that you would normally just look at and see. It was kind of just a unique aesthetic way to take a photo. And to sort of add another twist to it, we worked with Henrico Citizen 
and I reached out to them and asked if they would be interested in printing some of our pictures in the newspaper. They actually had to create a business pitch where they put all of their finished edited photos in a presentation and they had to sort of explain what elements and principles were present in their artwork, why their photos were aesthetically pleasing, and why they should be printed in the newspaper. They ultimately voted on the top five photos to be printed in Henrico Citizen. It was very exciting, because I've never really like been entered in an art contest or like really anything for people to see my art in. So it was very different. Photography is it's kind of a a forgiving art form. Um, you don't have to necessarily have the same kinds of raw skills that you might normally have for drawing or for painting or for some other art um, art forms. So when you go outside with a camera, it's it, it's it's all about your eye. It's all about what how you see things and how you capture things, and then how you kind of transform them through the editing process, which is really neat because I see a lot of students thrive with photography that might not otherwise thrive in in other art forms. 